Welcome everyone. Our next topic is the test for global education because the results are in. We've seen how COVID-19 has led to sharply reduced learning gains across the world, widening racial disparities in achievement, and of course, a rise in mental health afflictions among stuck at home students. We wanna look for ways to chart the way forward and future-proof the global recovery efforts. So to help me do that, are our panelists, Valerie Amos, the Master of University College at Oxford University, which is basically a fancy way of saying that she's the head of a college at Oxford. And in fact, she is the first black head. Prior to that, she was director at uh, University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies. She joins us from London. Joining us from Paris is Louise Mushikiwabo, the Secretary General of OIF or La Francophonie. The OIF is an international organization that represents countries and regions where French is a customary language and there's an affiliation with French culture. Louise was formerly a foreign minister for Rwanda. So I thank you both for joining us today on this important discussion. I wanna start big and, and just get your thoughts on some themes that have emerged as we reflect on what we've seen so far in the past year or two. Louise, why don't I start with you? If you could describe the impact of COVID-19 on the Francophone region of the world, what are the top themes that stand out to you as you look back? Well, thank you very much. Um, the, the, the top theme really uh, for not just the Francophone countries, but for all countries, uh, I believe, is, is, is connection or no connection. Um, and that is um, digital connection, and that is human connection. Um, and that affects very much the area of education. Our organization um, is, among other themes, uh, on the education of young people in our member states, where 88 um, member states and governments and what we noticed from the beginning of, of the pandemic was that even our own Francophone world was divided among those who have access to the internet, those who have access to medicines, and those who have very little or nothing in, in, both, in both areas. Um, but beyond, beyond that, what the Francophone world has, which is shared, with the world in general is also the um, inequalities. Uh, the inequalities that came specifically with the um, economic crisis. For some of our member states um, in Africa, for example, even the um, economic crisis came ahead of the health crisis as um, Africa was watching the rest of the world struggle with the, the pandemic in the beginning. Um, countries got organized, leaders quickly got on television, gave the example on how to properly wash hands, talked about the possibility of closing borders and so really did a fantastic job. But meanwhile, if you look at countries that are members like in North Africa, Tunisia, uh, Morocco, for example, East Africa, Rwanda, my own country that are very much on tourism and, um, and services, the economic crisis really, as I said, was there even ahead of the, of the health crisis, which took some time uh, before it reached uh, the continent. So those are, for me, the themes that stand out to the issues that became very apparent and hopefully from which we have, we are learning lessons because the crisis is not over yet. No, it's, it's certainly not. And of course it's moving forward or moving backwards at different paces. Valerie, let me come to you now because we go from the Francophone region to uh, higher education in the UK where you're based. Uh, obviously teachers, students, institutions had to pivot overnight from in-person learning to remote learning and that usually meant online learning, uh, sometimes synchronous, sometimes asynchronous. From where you sit, what worked better than you expected? What should be retained? What should be discarded? Well, first of all, let me uh, absolutely agree with the points that uh, Louise made. Those disparities, those differences, the kind of disadvantage that we've seen between countries, we're also seeing within countries, within communities, and also in higher education. So 
We have students who have greater access uh, to digital technology, uh, for example, were much more uh, able quickly uh, to pivot to uh, online uh, learning. But there was a huge amount of uh, work skills development that needed to be done with our academic colleagues uh, at the same time as working with our students to move to do these new ways of doing things. And of course, they missed each other and the element of knowledge development and learning that comes from that uh, social interaction. And let's not forget, it's not just about our academic colleagues and about students, it's about a whole university community. The people who work in the services that support uh, those students, support uh, those staff, they were also badly uh, affected. People had uh, their families, their communities who were affected by COVID, and also higher education is global. We had many students who were not able uh, to get home when we faced lockdown. What worked, what didn't work uh, so well? We're still learning the lessons from that. We have a lot of our students who actually appreciated uh, the putting, for example, of lectures online. They were able to go back to things, uh, refresh their knowledge, their experiences. I think the isolation, learning alone, uh, was something that people really didn't like and putting in place different ways of bringing uh, students and uh, their uh, tutors, uh, their uh, academic uh, tutors uh, together was very, very important. But also uh, building a, a social uh, sense uh, was very important as well, because it's to be intellectually stimulated, it's partly about the intellectual bit of this journey, but it's also about the shared uh, experiences of uh, learning together. That was very important. And you mentioned in your introduction the mental health elements of this. I think that it will take us some time to see the way that this has impacted not just universities, but our wider community. We have certainly put a lot more support uh, into welfare and well-being for our students and our staff as we have into the tuition element, the teaching element, the learning element over the last few months. That's a really important point, and we'll get to that shortly. But I, I want to pick up on what you mentioned, Valerie, about putting in place different ways to create connections and shared social experiences. Louise, can you talk a little bit about the specific new initiatives that you've undertaken during this pandemic um, and the impact or the challenges you may have experienced while trying to implement them um, across the different uh, regions that you cover? Oh, um the first thing we did at uh, Francophonie within, I'd say, two weeks uh, was to uh, put together and organize for ease of use uh, educational materials in French. And we noticed that very quickly some of the young people, the students, the countries, the schools were consuming these uh, um, educational materials um, but at the same time, we noticed and we were aware of this, that uh, many of our uh, young people were not able to access the, the, the educational materials simply because they didn't have the tools. So we continued to provide uh, culturally accurate uh, materials for those who were connected. But we also, with our, uh, mainly with our Institute for Education, the Francophone Institute for Education, which is based in Dakar, Senegal, uh, quickly developed uh, programs for those who, who were not, uh, young people who were not uh, connected, uh, mainly with radio programs, TV programs, in uh, support of countries which quickly also tried to scramble and figure out what to do, especially in the education area when, when, confinement, uh, when confinement started. 
it, it became very difficult because, um, of course, lack of tools, lack of connection, large families sharing uh, one TV or one radio, or one computer and so forth. Another thing we did quickly um, was to respond to the economic side of things. And we put together within uh, months uh, a, a fund that would come to support women who lost their livelihoods just because they could not go out and work. And we are talking about um, women who are in the most vulnerable situations, whose livelihood depends on walking out of their homes in the morning, going to the market, selling small things, tomatoes, soap, uh, vegetables on the market and they couldn't do it. So many of these women were affected across the world and, and across the Francophone world, uh, of course. So what we did here at headquarters in, in Paris is we put together quickly monies that uh, were not used for travel, for conferences, for workshops, and started this fund uh, called La Francophonie avec elle, literally Francophonie on the side of, of women to um, uh, bring uh, a bit of money to support these women during this time, especially of uh, confinement. And we were able, and I'm very proud of that because we tend to be very slow in the multilateral world, that the Francophonie was able to actually disperse uh, to 59 um, uh, projects, initiatives across the Francophone world, 20 countries, to women that were in economic uh, precarity. I have had the opportunity since uh, last year to visit uh, some of these women and in Togo, in Lebanon, and recently in Rwanda, my own country, and very happy to see that, you know, we don't realize that when we live in big cities and, uh, you know, making yeah. big international salaries that even 100 euros can go a long way to support these women. So that fund is there, it, it's now, we're now in the second phase. Um, uh, projects are being selected across, uh, across the world. And, mm -hmm. and so that economic support was extremely important. There are other things we did, putting together innovators in the digital uh, world, young people mostly, also from more than 60 countries, connecting them, sharing ideas. And, and I'm really happy to say that we were positively surprised by the talent and the kind of innovation to support their own communities, uh, that young yeah. people across the world actually were really up to the task and uh, that connection of Francophone innovators in the digital area is still on as well. It's a great example of how you can use something that worked in one place and, and apply it as best practices across the region and really scale your response and, and the possible solutions out there. Um, I want to talk briefly, Valerie, and, and go back to the point you mentioned, which was about mental health, because as you look at how to solve for the issues that have arisen because of the pandemic, we know that government um, is funds education and governments love to spend time and money to try to resolve longstanding issues. So save the government some time and money for us here. What do you think is the hardest truth about some possible solutions to these increased mental health concerns? What, what's worked perhaps somewhere else in the world that could be applied to where you are? So first of all, in terms of who funds education, I think it's really important in the context of the United Kingdom to be clear that it is not just the, the, the government that funds uh, education. Uh, students themselves fund uh, their education through the, uh, the fees that they pay, the tuition uh, fees. You have uh, major uh, donors who support us. Uh, there are the research councils and the huge amount of research that we see uh, that is the result of uh, international collaboration uh, across the world uh, from research councils and of course you know, I'm incredibly proud that, you know, Oxford was right up there uh, developing uh, a vaccine uh, to help uh, with the uh, pandemic. And I think one of the big learnings that we have seen, particularly in relation to uh, science, is that uh, increased collaboration and the importance of working uh, together. To come specifically to your point uh, about uh, mental health, I don't think that we can point to any one uh, place that does this uh, really, really well. I think that there are aspects of it. What we have uh, found is that it's important 
uh, to be available, to be available 24-7, uh, to have a team uh, uh, made up of people uh, from different uh, communities with different skill sets so that uh, individuals feel able to approach uh, members of uh, that team, to have other resources uh, available for those who need more intense uh, work, to recognise that we need to work collaboratively across universities uh, on this. Uh, and because our, some of our students were not with us here in college, to find ways of picking up the kinds of uh, uh, almost uh, invisible signs that you would sometimes get as a result of uh, us being together, that someone is experiencing uh, challenges and uh, difficulties. So where and how you invest uh, the money, where you put the kind of human uh, resources and the contact and open up uh, the opportunity to uh, call on a range of organizations working across um, a range of different uh, issues uh, is incredibly uh, important. And just being available to talk, uh, that human interaction has become more and more important the more isolated we have become. And it's the thing that we cannot let go of. It is costly in terms of time and in terms yeah. of financial and other resources, but we have to make those investments. And of course, everyone is also moving on to a world that's very uncertain. We know that um, COVID has exacerbated existing inequities. The rich got richer, the poor got poor, and more than ever, people are just trying to, to get by, to make do. We touched on this earlier, this idea of digital connection, connectivity. Clearly, the U.S., parts of Europe are emerging from the pandemic because of mass vaccines. That's not the case in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. So Louise, let me come to you because this is something that obviously touches upon your part of the world. For the children who are not online um, and on our rural parts of the country, their country with no uh, online connectivity, what are the immediate solutions beyond waiting, beyond getting donations? What, what can be done more quickly in the next six months, in the next one year? Well, what we noticed um, with, with our experience, especially uh, in the first few months of, uh, of, of confinement, was that, um, as I said, you know, in one household, there was one TV, maybe one smartphone, and a few uh, young students, their parents. By the way, the teachers as well. We, we noticed that uh, some of the teachers that are trained by our institute uh, based in Dakar were not really uh, savvy. They were not uh, very conversant with uh, how to quickly use some of these digital tools for, for, for education. So what we did with uh, our institute was to uh, quickly find offline solutions to provide uh, access to educational resources. But we also noticed that um, uh, social media uh, became a very good tool for education where uh, teachers started sending homework to uh, young people on their parents' uh, uh, smartphones and, 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 and that works. Now, what is clear for, for us, and, and this is probably where I should have started, is that education without access to the internet for a big part of the world is a major, major issue that I think uh, as we slowly come out of uh, this, hopefully, uh, this pandemic, it's something we need to look at. It should be a global concern um, the kind of uh, uh, inequality that, you know, beyond health goes into lack of education is something that really calls for uh, very much uh, global cooperation. Um, of course, money is the issue uh, because education, of course, is, is to begin with an area that is uh, budget consuming. But it's something we really need to, to look at carefully. And hopefully one of the lessons is that uh, funding for solutions that are not necessarily 
based on access to the internet, as well as providing more access to the internet for, for young people, especially for, for people in the area of education, really should become a priority lesson coming out of the, out of the, the crisis, at least for the long term. Sure, sure. Louise, let me come to you. Um, excuse me, uh, Valerie, let me come to you for the final question here. I do want to touch on vaccine diplomacy because uh, Louise mentioned global cooperation. You have countries like the US donating now doses, finally. Um, countries like China and Russia also have used their vaccine rollout to gain credibility, to gain influence in developing countries. Very quickly here, what do you think are the long term effects of that kind of vaccine diplomacy on young people as they seek? higher education and look to build their futures? So I think the first thing is that our young people will look at is essentially how long it took uh, for countries to really get together and to deliver on something which we all know is important, which is uh, none of us is safe until we're all safe. And whilst we all recognize and understand that of course a government will prioritize its own people first, we saw many countries uh, procure way more vaccine than they actually needed. And it took a long time to actually persuade uh, those countries that we needed to share. And what has come out of the G7, the seven richest countries uh, in the world this weekend is really important. But there was also uh, the MasterCard Foundation, 1.3 billion over three years in partnership with uh, the Africa Center for uh, Disease Control. Uh, the COVAX consortium through the World Health uh, Organization, all of these are incredibly uh, important. It's not just about individual countries seeking uh, influence, it needs to be the world working together. And that's what our young people are fighting for. If you look at the way that they have been active around uh, things like Black Lives Matter, around uh, climate change, uh, around uh, Me Too. They are using social media and their power to act collectively across the world. And the governments are coming in behind that. They're much slower. Our young people are going to look to faster action for their governments or they're going to do it themselves. Well said. I want to thank both of you so much for joining us on this panel on uh, global education. Valerie Amos of Oxford University and Louise Mushikiwabo of the OIF. Thank you. Thank you.